I'm uh, Dr. Freudenreich, I'm a psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital and I treat uh, patients with psychotic disorders. In psychiatry we agree that psychosis is simply the presence of either delusions or hallucinations. In many textbooks you will see the definition that delusions are fixed false beliefs. I don't want to dismantle this definition too much except pointing out that it's not quite right. Not all delusions are fixed. If anything, the hope for treatment is that delusions are not so fixed that they cannot be addressed in therapy. Not all delusions are necessarily false. Quite often, in fact, delusions have a clear kernel of truth that maybe even have triggered delusional thinking. It leaves us with this problem that I'm sometimes not quite sure if I should label something a delusion or if something is more like an extreme belief. The distinction is really, really critical. For delusions, we have the treatment in form of you know, psychiatric medicines, for example. Antipsychotics are not an effective treatment for extreme beliefs. And some political beliefs you might call extreme. I think you would agree with me that psychiatric treatment and antipsychotics are not the right way of approaching political beliefs. Delusions don't occur in isolation in the vast majority of patients. There's other evidence of schizophrenia, to use that disease as an example. Motor problems, for example, or something that we call negative symptoms, lack of motivation and many other things, which you would not expect in somebody who simply has a weird idea of sorts, if you will. The other thing that helps you differentiate between delusions or overvalued ideas, as they are sometimes called, is the degree of conviction the idea that when you ask people, is it possible that you're wrong, do you see the other side? If somebody is really psychotic with very strong delusions, it's really hard to argue with people around this idea that they could be wrong. It's important to also be clear what psychosis is not, because I think a lot of people just call somebody that is mysterious, that shows unexplained behaviors as psychotic. It's really not a catch-all category. We should not label people as psychotic because we don't know what else they have. It is a symptom, so it's not a diagnosis. It's just like fever. If you have fever, that doesn't help your doctor to determine what to do next. We have a list of conditions that can cause psychosis. As a psychiatrist, I deal with conditions that on the psychiatric side can cause psychosis. The prototypical disorder or disease that causes psychosis is schizophrenia. But psychosis occurs in other psychiatric conditions. Bipolar disorder is probably the most important example of another serious disorder where psychosis is really part and parcel of the presentation for many patients. And many other psychiatric conditions might have aspects of psychosis associated with them. It's really important though to make sure that psychosis is not the result of drug use and a treatable a medical condition. For example, an overactive thyroid would be one typical example where you actually order a thyroid test to make sure that a patient with psychosis is not in fact experiencing an overactive uh, thyroid gland. Drugs of abuse are probably the more common thing to worry about when somebody is psychotic. Some drugs very reliably cause psychosis in almost everybody if taken enough. Cocaine comes to mind, methamphetamines, the stimulants, LSD, those drugs that people actually seek out for the psychotic experiences. Cannabis used to be a drug people very rarely would develop psychosis unless they had a genetic vulnerability towards it. Today I have to say the potency of cannabis products has increased dramatically and so has the risk for people to become psychotic when using cannabis products. I think it's fair to say that cannabis is clearly a risk factor for developing schizophrenia and certainly patients who have family members with psychosis or who may themselves have an episode of being a little bit paranoid when using cannabis absolutely should not use cannabis products because it probably interacts in some ways genetically or with the brain to set them up for developing the long-term illness of schizophrenia. So as a psychiatrist, I treat patients with psychotic disorders 
And trying to determine if somebody has psychosis is really critical. The problem is that the person who ex is experiencing psychosis needs to be willing to talk to me. Some patients are very eloquent, describing their inner experiences. Others are completely unable to describe to you how they perceive their inner lives, which makes it very difficult sometimes. So if somebody is paranoid about a neighbor but does not want to tell me, I have no way really of knowing. Similarly, if somebody is experiencing auditory hallucinations, if he or she is, is hearing voices but does not want to tell me about it, I might have a hard time determining that the patient is actually psychotic. It's really critical, I think, to find a, a good match with somebody who's willing to stick with the patient and just build on developing trust that at some point a person feels comfortable and safe enough to actually tell them what they're thinking. There are other markers of psychosis that are indirect. If somebody avoids eye contact, seems paranoid, becomes evasive, doesn't want to talk about it, that might be a hint a little bit that psychosis may be present. Very often, the first sign of psychosis is not that the young person, for example, will report to the family that they're hearing voices. Uh, they might worry that they're getting labeled as being crazy. So we look for other indirect markers that somebody is psychotic. And one of those is that people really withdraw from life. They uh, might no longer want to go to school. Their grades might drop. It's this role failure that's out of character for somebody that makes me very worried that a serious illness may be present. For the majority of people, if they have schizophrenia, it's not just going to go away. It's something that needs to be attended to that requires good treatment. But I also point out to families that with good treatment, with support, in most cases, this illness is very manageable. Some people may adjust some expectations that they had. And yet, with treatment, with support, I think many people can do a lot better than is often assumed. Sometimes I get asked if it's not difficult to treat people with psychotic disorders. You know, sometimes you find yourself in this kind of fight almost. Wait it out, accompany patients in their suffering, be available to them over time, be firm, so I will tell people that I think it's extremely unlikely that the phone in my office, for example, is tapped by the FBI. Now, I can never be sure myself because it's certainly possible. It's just extremely unlikely. So my professional training is important in order to do that well and not burn out. I say this because I see families burning out. They don't have the professional training. They're unsure often how to respond. They will say, no, don't you understand that the FBI is not monitoring our house? And they really get in fights over this. And at some point, sadly enough, families will, will cut their losses. That means that they have no longer contact with their loved ones who then end up in shelters. That's a disaster for, for a family. And, and we work very hard as a program, for example, or me as a psychiatrist, to involve families, to provide psychoeducation, to help people not take it personal, and to pace themselves in the end, to avoid getting in these power struggles, who's, who's right or wrong. It's not about being, being right or wrong. It's about trying to help people most effectively to live a life despite having an illness with symptoms, including some psychosis. I prescribe medications, antipsychotics, which in most cases work really well. It's really important though to appreciate that the medicines as important as they are only are important for 20%. Now it's an important 20% because without that you never get to 100%, but the other 80% is everybody else involved in people's care. So it's family member, but very often that's people in group homes, that's outreach workers, that's social workers. It's, it's those people that really in the end are helping people to come to terms with having an illness, coming to terms with having to take medicines, to going to a doctor, to help people remember Remember that they have an appointment to come with them to help them to get on the tea here in Boston. Those are the things that make the difference. You know, if a group home gets together and looks, can we all collectively quit smoking in the group home? The breakfast that we offer is that the best we can do. So these are all things that will in the long run really matter to patients. 
Medical health is really important. The number one cause of death in the group of patients that I treat is actually cardiovascular disease. So the prevention of cardiovascular disease is of utmost importance for my patients. Smoking cessation, healthy diet, a regular exercise regimen are all critical. And that's where people in the community, I think, are absolutely critical. You know, the people in the trenches, the people in group homes, the people that I said they might come with patients to the appointments. From a patient's perspective, at the interpersonal level, those are the people that actually care about them. Those are things that matter if somebody wants to recover from an illness. Recovery to me means living well despite having an illness. It doesn't mean to be untreated or not need medicines, but it means to at some level accept the, the medical treatment that's necessary, but then moving on psychologically and making the best of the situation. And if I just look back 10 years ago, conceptually at the societal level, it's very clear. We don't talk about schizophrenia in paternalistic terms anymore the way we used to just 10 years ago. The Department of Mental Health in Massachusetts, for example, has put great efforts in helping people to recover, to live meaningfully despite having an illness. Uh, we now routinely use peers, people with lived experience, to help people with schizophrenia lead better lives. I would like for people to truly understand what psychosis is, to understand that there is a role for the state to actually provide state-of-the-art services for people who do need our help. I'm quite excited about the next decade. In medicine, we really are at the cusp of developing personalized treatments that are really tailored to individual patients' needs. And so this one-size-fits-all, increasingly, I think we're going to see is no longer going to be applicable. Ten years from now, I would like to have fewer people that I call patients because they have a psychiatric illness in jails or in the streets, but instead I would like them to be in good outpatient programs that supports them and allows them to live up to their fullest potential. Thank you for watching this video, and we would love to share more with you. So please subscribe to this YouTube channel. For more information about all of our trainings, please visit the link below.